I'm happy to be here once again in virtual capacity to present to you our annual drug trends and benchmarks. I always need to start with a joke, which is typically to make fun of the consultants that are widely represented in these <laughs> sessions. I hope I can get away with it simply because I came from years in that field. Actually reminds me of a story, conveniently enough. So the chickens in a large hen house started to quarrel, wounding each other and many of them died every day. The upset farmer hurried to a consultant and asked for a solution to his problems. Add baking powder to the chicken's food, said the consultant. It will calm them down. After a week, the farmer came back to the consultant and said, my chickens continue to die. What do I need to do? Well, add strawberry juice to the drinking water. That's gonna help for sure. A week passed again and the farmer came to the consultant. My chickens are still quarreling and dying. Do you have some more advice? And Dalton said, well, I can give you more and more advice. But the real question is, do you have any more chickens? It's not all that funny. But anyways, so I think most people are going to be happy to, to see that I've moved on from the sheep jokes of the past, and I've graduated to some chickens. So on that note, I can only go up from here. I will get into the actual agenda. So today, our outline is we're going to review our 2020 data this year, obviously. We're going to compare to prior years where appropriate. We'll touch on key results, uh, utilization by drug types, specialty drug analysis, including biosimilar uptake analysis. We're also going to now this year touch on some observations that COVID-19 had on our claiming patterns. That's going to be followed by our traditional uh, book of business rankings, and then we'll end off as usual with our plan design and trends across our, our book of business. All right, into the terminology. So as always, we need to touch on terminology to ensure we socialize with the audience how we measure certain things. Often terms like insured certificate, card holder, claimant plan member may be used interchangeably. So for those purposes, um, we will focus on mostly insured and in, in that context, that's an, any individual that is covered and it doesn't matter whether they made a claim or not, it, it's based on coverage and eligibility. Um, it doesn't matter whether they're the employee spouse or dependent either. It's an individual that's covered and can make a claim. Uh, from a certificate, when we look at certificates, really we're linking all the um, members under, or all the insureds under one you know, certificate or, or family, basically. Um, sorry. So the other thing that we always focus on is eligible costs. And, and the reason we do that is to really neutralize the plan design differences. Um, so using eligible costs strips away things like differences in, in features like deductibles, coinsurance, et cetera. So it's the amount eligible, uh, drug cost eligible, including dispensing fee, but prior to any application of coinsurance and, and deductible. So, also to note that um, you need to be aware when you're making comparisons with a specific group. Um, what I'm going to present may differ significantly from the plans you manage or administer on the, on the case of the insurers. So use caution when making these, these comparisons. The coverage level of the plan, the demographics, composition of the demographics, provincial program coordination even, uh, and, and industry can really impact costs. So keep that in mind while you review these results. So our analysis will always reflect lower trend than is used in insur insurance renewals. Um, and and this, this gets brought up quite often. So the trend that, in, uh, that insurer renewals use is forward looking to provide a projection of potential costs over the next 12 months. Well, our data is actually looking at the actual retrospective year-over-year -year change from, in this case, 2019 to 2020. So different way of looking at what we're calling trend. Uh, the insurer's renewal trend also takes into a whole bunch of other, other information points, such as specific claims experience of the group, obviously, um, changes in demographics of the group, uh, insurer's manual rate or, or call it book rate, also includes additional medical claims in the calculation. So it's not just drug in that, in that healthcare trend. And, and as we know that um, there are other uh, medical claims that are growing at a pretty high rate as well when you consider certain paramedicals. Okay, 
So having said that, continuing on to uh, the different types of drugs, uh, drug types that we're going to talk about. Um, from a traditional drug perspective, a single source brand is a brand drug where there is no generic equivalent. So it's still under patent protection. Um, and then we look at multi-source brands. So that's a, that's a brand drug that was claimed, but there is a generic that it would exist. So examples would be, um, say, Nexium um, was claimed, but there's generic esomeprazole that could have been claimed as its uh, generic counterpart. Uh, and then generics are a lower cost copy of, of the original brand. So with, with the same chemical strength, form, and route of administration. So it needs to meet those four criteria. Uh, keep in mind though, we're going to, we're going to talk a little bit about some biosimilars today and, and they're not really the same as traditional chemical generic drugs to their brown brand counterpart. Uh, and we'll get into that a little bit later as we move along. Also, we're going to be focusing on insureds under age 65 for the most part. Uh, but the usual, usual just disclaimer of OHIP plus is going to apply. So once again, we need to make adjustments for relevance given we now see claim costs for the under 25 age cohort returning in Ontario after April 2019. So even though this is 2020 data, but we're comparing back to 2019 and the three months of 2019 at the beginning of the year was when OHIP plus was still in effect. So we make some adjustments and we will look at the, again, the 25 to 64 age group across Canada just to, to eliminate that, that bias. Um, so when we look at the number of certificates and scope of the review, you'll see our coverage actually decreased over last year. So uh, across Canada, 1.4% uh, less certificates. So some of that drop could be COVID-19 related given business closures and or temporary layoffs that resulted in loss of benefit coverage. Our book of business reduced in Ontario at a greater drop than outside of Ontario. Uh, at 2.5% two two reduction in certificates versus that 0.6% you see. So cumulative, cumulatively, that's a, a reduction of 1.4% across Canada. However, the claim utilization results we will walk through are based on nearly 13 million Canadians with over 160 million transactions processed annually across 2020. All right, let's jump into the key results. So if we look at key indicators by a region, as noted earlier, we're gonna remove the comparative effects of OHIP plus. So we're gonna look at just the 25 to 64 cohort here. Um, the monthly eligible cost per insured across Canada was $55.95, as you see. This was up slightly over last year. The lowest is actually in the West, 41.96, and this is um, this trends this way every year and, and mainly due to pharmacare coverage in, in some of the provinces. The average eligible cost per claim in, is highest in Ontario at $86.51, while lowest in Quebec. The utilization rate is highest in Quebec, primarily given Quebec pharmacies generally dis dispense that 30-day supply even for chronic medication. So that means obviously more claims per year per insured and lower claim cost because it's it's a lower quantity. We see generic fill rates in Atlantic Canada are now up to 71% of all claims are filled for a generic. Yet if you look at the if you look at the average uh, monthly cost per insured, um, still quite high for Atlantic Canada. So it really doesn't even the, in the higher generic substitution rate doesn't really translate into lower cost. Uh, and you'll see later that Atlanta, Canada continues to have the highest percentage of specialty drug consumption. So we'll start to unpack some of these numbers as we move through. Here we're going to focus to start off on the zero to 64 to see the changes year over year in eligible monthly cost per insured. The year over year change in cost per insured has risen 3.8%. Uh, you will, may recall last year, this was much higher as 2019 was when OHIP Plus was repealed in Ontario. So that did result in increased cost to private plans for that under 25 and Ontario age cohort. Uh, Quebec actually had the highest increase at 5%. Uh, you'll see later, that's largely attributable to higher specialty drug costs uh, that we're seeing in Quebec over last year. 
And now when we look at 25 to 64, um, the eligible cost per claim uh, is, has, was only 1.5% increase year over year. Um, but if we look at cost per claim in Quebec, it's gone up 3.3%. So again, tie it, we'll tie that back to some of the specialty drug uh, increases in, in the, the province. So overall, the change in cost per claim, which is a function of inflationary changes and therapeutic mix, has had its lowest levels in increase in recent years at that 1.5%. But then again, it is still higher than CPI inflation across 2020 if you were to look at CPI average growth by month across 2020. Here we see utilization rate is actually increasing more than the cost per claim. So on a national basis, we see the 2.1% increase in utilization, so number of claims per insured uh, has gone up. It is varied quite by region. Ontario had the highest change in utilization at 2.4%. And then we see lower increases across the other regions. Given the large claiming volume and population from Ontario, that 2.4% increase did have a significant influence on the overall national number of 2.1%. Here, we're gonna overlay the black numbers at the top. These were, uh, these were what we showed when we looked at the zero to 64. But when we remove the under 25 age category, you'll see Ontario grew at a, a much more moderate percentage at 3.3% compared to the 4.3% we showed in the earlier slide when you remove that, the impact by, of OHIP plus in Ontario. Um, interesting to note is that the percentage increase in all other regions is higher when you look at the 25 and over age cohort than when you exclude it. So it does make sense, um, right? When you strip out younger than 25, um, you're looking at an older, older age cohort, obviously, and, and generally we're seeing more chronic conditions and more costly therapies. Uh, Okay, so on to the components that are making up that trend. So we saw in this prior slide that overall trend went up 3.6 across Canada. And again, I'm considering trend to be the average monthly cost per insured change year over year. Um, so the growth in the specialty drug cost continues to eclipse the growth in traditional drugs. So we're seeing here 8.7% specialty drugs went up year over year compared to just 1.3% for non-specialty or traditional. Um, it is still a little bit lower than uh, the 8.7 is quite a fair bit lower than last year. We saw it was actually 10.1% that specialty drugs trend went up. Uh, as we see later, specialty drugs continue to grow as a percentage of overall plan costs. And again, it's fueled by only a small, small percentage of total claimants as you look. So the annual trend rate is a function of both changes in utilization per insured and average cost per claim. Uh, you'll see overall we have uh, how that 3.6% of all drugs, how that trend is, is comprised and it's, it's in fact higher utilization at, as I said, 2.1% versus that cost per claim increases is 1.5%. So higher influence on utilization is driving that 3.6% trend. Uh, it does shift a little bit. Um, it, the, the numbers are changing, obviously, across specialty drugs and traditional. Um, but specialty drugs, it's really utilization is, is the biggest component of that increase of 8.7%. So we are seeing more newer, more novel therapies coming to market. They're treating new diseases that weren't treated before with the specialty product. Um, diseases that were previously either untreated or undertreated. So we're going to continue to see increased uh, utilization of these breakthrough products uh, as years come. Okay, so let's look at age differences and, and breaking down the monthly eligible costs per insured by age bands. Drug benefit costs increase as we age. I know it says Captain Obvious. But what may not be so obvious is the difference monthly cost of a 60 to 64 year old is compared to that under 25 year old. It's over six times higher when we look at the $101 to uh, just around $15 for under 25. So younger people typically claiming more acute therapies, generally lower cost, but then as we age, chronic conditions become more prevalent. 
not uncommon to see someone in their 50s and 60s on several different medications to treat a variety of, of conditions. Uh, you can see someone for type 2 diabetes, for example, they'd be on a diabetic drug, often also treating other comorbid conditions such as hypertension, elevated cholesterol, uh, maybe even mental health and pain management. So uh, utilization obviously much, much higher and, and the, the therapy mix across claimants is much broader when, as we age. Now, continuing with age, if we compare 2019, we see that the highest cost increased over last year was actually in the 25 to 29 age band. Uh, but as we saw in the previous slide, that age group is relatively low cost compared to the older age group. So yeah, it's growing at a faster rate, but the baseline is much smaller, so maybe not much to be concerned with. But similar to last year, the oldest age band is, is witnessing the lowest cost growth at only 3.3%. But again, if we look back to the prior slide, uh, that baseline is much higher. That's a hundred dollar over hundred dollars uh, monthly cost per insured. So that that age cohort's certainly the costliest on their private plans. And then obviously, once you hit 65 in most provinces, pharmacare will kick in. Okay, on to drug uh, drug type utilization. Generic utilization, uh, as you'll recall from the the key results slide, on a national basis, it was 64%. Uh, but you can see the differences here by region that we're focusing on. Atlantic Canada continues to have the highest generic utilization. It's now hitting 71% in 2020. Uh, Ontario had the lowest, with 62% of all claims being filled for a generic. So we do see a slow climb towards higher generic dispensing over the years, given many of the more traditional, higher utilized drugs have become genericized. Uh, however, we're still well below generic penetration rates that they have seen in the US. Uh, they're around the mid 80s, uh, but really that's, that's a function of their tiered formularies that, that really promote uh, preferred drug utilization. If we look at multi-source brand utilization, the percentage, which, noted, or which we noted earlier, uh, these are brand drugs that had an interchangeable generic equivalent on the market. So brand drug was dispensed, uh, but uh, there was a generic equivalent that could have been dispensed. Highest in Quebec at 7%, even though um, that province has, has reduced multi-source brand utilization significantly if you look over uh, back since 2012. Uh, so it's 7%, but this is despite a 1% increase in generic utilization. Back, we saw on the prior slide that that generic utilization actually went up one percent. So there seems to be a reduction, or there is a reduction in single source brand drug utilization as well in Quebec. Uh, one thing to keep in mind is that these numbers are based on the drug dispense. So those plans that have a mandatory generic substitution plan design would have only paid up to the generic equivalent price in some instances. We look at a number of claims perspective over the years. Um, we see nominal increases in utilization of generic drugs and corresponding reductions in utilization of brand drugs across the years. Not not a lot has changed. Uh, however, for single source brand drugs, we saw we did see a one percent uptick in the number of claims over 2019. If we look at that from a cost perspective. Single source brand drugs continue to dominate the percentage of overall eligible amount paid, now reaching 71% of total plan costs nationally. So uh, this is largely driven by the significant cost for specialty medications that we'll see in future slides. So obviously specialty medications um, would all be uh, considered single source. So we are now seeing specialty medications that reach a broader patient population for chronic diseases which will continue to drive this category upward. Generics, although we saw on the prior slide very highly utilized, now account for less than one quarter of total eligible amounts nationally. Highly utilized, low cost, um, not making up a big percentage of the pie. Okay, on to specialty drugs and biosimilar drugs. So we'll, we'll talk about some definitions before we move through the next few slides. So there, there, there really is no standard definition of a specialty drug. 
most PBMs and insurers consider any drug with an annual treatment cost over 10,000 a year to be considered specialty. So this applies to both biologic, biosimilars, and even small molecule drugs. Well, specialty doesn't always mean consider that it's a biologic, but it's really based on cost. But by and large, they are biologic drugs. Generally, these specialty drugs require special handling and administration. They're always going to treat more rare and complex disease. Uh, often they're, you know, infections, infusions. So obviously they're very high cost. Um, but these breakthrough drugs are changing the way we treat serious and very rare conditions. So we'd be remiss if we don't re really point that out. So technology has come a long way now with more targeted drug therapy, uh, such as immunotherapy, uh, gene therapy. So as with anything, innovation and advancements in medicine will come at a cost. Uh, it's also important to consider the return that these drugs um, have, providing they keep people healthy and productive. So, having said that, we are now seeing specialty drug costs reaching about one third of total drug costs. Uh, we also observed a larger than average increase in the number of claimants in this class now moving up from 1.1% to 1.3%. Doesn't seem like a lot, but uh, comparatively one year later, that is, that is a, a fair jump in the, in the actual claimant exposure to, to um, specialty drugs. So you can see disproportionate number of claimants are driving high costs. Uh, and the, the specialty drug has increased significantly over the last decade. Uh, and based on the current pipeline, uh, we believe that this percentage will persist. We're starting to see the first signs of broadening utilization of specialty drugs as a result of new specialty drug classes and novel treatment options that are becoming more prevalent in therapy. Now, if we break it down by region, again, Atlantic Canada's percentage of specialty drug costs is the highest now at 40%, and it was 38% last year. Uh, costs for specialty drugs continue to be a factor in that region, given higher prevalence of certain rare diseases. So, for example, Atlantic Canada has a disproportionate share of high-cost genetic replacement therapy drugs that seem to be propelling overall specialty drug costs year over year. Western provinces continue to see lower specialty drug costs, again, given provincial pharmacare programs um, that are paying some of the costs, and as well, there's certain policies as we'll talk about uh, where biosimilar drugs uh, are being pre or preference treatment in BC. So that's, that will have an impact again on specialty drug costs overall. Okay, so looking at the period, we're going back a long way now to 2008 to 2020. When we look back at the total monthly cost per certificate, and regardless of drug type, so this is all drugs in, we're now at $97 per month. This has increased on average 2.2% per year over these, this 12 year period that we're showing here. So when we layer on non-specialty drugs, they're actually showing a negative growth over the same 12 year period, averaging 0.6% decrease each year. Now with a monthly cost per certificate of $66, which is unchanged from last year. Much of this drop uh, can be attributed to generic pricing legislation over the years and, and more drugs becoming genericized on, on, on specialty front. So to demonstrate the impact of specialty drug products over the years, the cost of these drugs are growing at a much faster rate than traditional drugs, increasing on average nearly 14% each year over the past 12 year period, now reaching an average monthly cost per certificate of $31. So $31 doesn't seem like a lot, but keep in mind this is the average monthly cost across all certificates. And we know that less than 2% of total claimants are contributing to that to specialty drug costs. Now, if we project that forward, um, again, linear, just on a linear basis, the monthly cost per certificate for specialty drugs could be as high as $60 in 2026. Uh, and that would account for, as you can see, nearly half of the overall monthly cost per certificate. 
and if that's the case, totaling monthly cost per certificate of all drugs combined would be $124. So that's an increase of 28% over the $97 we observed this past year. So very, very high growth. And obviously there'll be a, a, a number of factors that will uh, uh, increase growth and actually offset growth if we look at um, you know, some of the biosimilar initiatives. We're going to get into more detail on our top drug categories, uh, and this is based on percentages of adjudicated amount, um, but we're looking here at the top seven categories. To gain a perspective on what is driving costs within these categories, it's important to review the split between specialty and non-specialty that makes up the cost. So you can see RA category, um, used typically immunomodulator drugs, uh, mostly biologics, 100% uh, of that, um, almost 100% is made up of specialty drug costs. Uh, in contrast, diabetes drugs is, uh, cost very, very high, but there really isn't any truly defined specialty drugs as, as we're defining them as over 10,000 per year. Um, so, but there is a lot of newer therapies in diabetes that um, are, are resulting in, the newer therapies are resulting in about two thirds of the total cost uh, across that class. And cancer, we're seeing significant specialty drug utilization, and that will continue given given the, the specialty drugs in the in the pipeline are, are a lot of them are focused around oncology. So we saw in the drug trend slide earlier that um, specialty drugs went up 8.7% nationally. Um, and then we also saw that Quebec had very high growth year over year in total cost. So Quebec actually witnessed here, you'll see a 10.4% increase, um, much higher than the other regions. So before the next slide, we're gonna go into our first pooling question. So I'll read it out. So outside of BC, what percentage of total costs do biosimilars make up in those categories that have both a biologic and biosimilar approved? Is it one, less than 10%, two, between 10% and 30%, or three, over 30%? Biosimilars making up. Oh, people are smart. Um, okay, so if you answer two, you are correct. Um, and I'll show you here. When we look at biosimilar cost distribution outside of Canada, or sorry, outside of BC, so what we call the rock, rest of Canada, we're seeing here there has not been material change in the cost attributed to biosimilars in the last, um, across the last 24 month period. Still remains relatively low, reaching just 13% of costs in 2020. But if I layer on what's happening in BC, reasons why, um, you'll see it's much different. So beginning when the policy in BC was announced in May and then implemented in November, we've seen a steady increase in the percentage of costs of biosimilar, biosimilar drugs make up in the classes that have both a biosimilar and an innovator biologic. So phase one of that policy was to apply to Enbrel, Remicade, and Lantus. Um, so that's what you're seeing in here. So even though the public policy only applies to public plan claims, it appears a private plan prescribing is actually following suit as well. Another way of looking at the prior analysis is how the relative cost changed per claimant given increased adoption in biosimilars in the province of BC. So if we look at January 2019 as the baseline, the relative cost per claimant in BC reduced actually 67% of what it was in January 2019. And again, that's because we are seeing more claimants move to the lower cost biosimilars. Uh, but if you look outside of, of BC, um, that's, it's quite a bit different. We're seeing an 18% increase um, December uh, 2020 over what the baseline was in January 20. The next few slides are going to focus on both biosimilar new starts and biosimilar switches, and we'll also compare BC to the rest of Canada. I'm choosing Remicade here just for illustration, but also because it is continues to be the number one drug with respect to eligible costs under a claimed under a book of business. So when we consider a new start, we look back at claim history over the last 24 months 
at a patient level, so longitudinal analysis, and determine whether the claimant was treatment naive at that point, um, at the point when they claimed the, the first drug. In BC, we see new starts of the biosimilars in Q1 accounted for about um, 70%. So Remake, the reference biologic or innovator, is only 30%. Uh, as the year moves on, um, we see it ends about uh, 86% in Q4. Uh, different situation we see in the rest of Canada. Uh, new starts are by and large beginning on the reference biologic, although there, we are showing a slight decline from 87% in the start of 2020 to the 81% we're seeing in Q4 2020. Now to look at switches, um, we determine whether the patient was first on a reference biologic in their data set and then switched to a biosimilar. Uh, so of the two approved biosimilar switches, seems about 50-50 in Q1, um, but as, as time goes on, the switches were, were more so towards uh, Inflectra. And if we look at the rest of Canada, similar situation with switches, uh, kind of a 50-50 split, but uh, as, as time moves on, the, the switches are, are gradually moving towards one biosimilar over the other. Okay, COVID-19 impact. Okay, this is a bit of a busy slide, but when we isolate maintenance medications, so those are that are, are chronic therapies ongoing, um, we actually saw that transactions were, were up year over year. Uh, so the green bar is 2020 in, in the bottom of the graph. Um, but there is a reason for that. Um, maintenance medication volumes were higher from March to June, as you can see in the, in the graph, uh, much higher, um, basically because uh, the, the, the typical three-month supply of maintenance medications being dispensed in a one-month supply given pharmacy restrictions that were announced in provinces. So there was really fear over drug shortages of supply, and also there was some hoarding going on where people were trying to fill early and uh, so they wanted to guard against that, and everybody was only being limited to a 30-day 30, 30 supply. So we did see um, a short-term jump there because of that. Um, but also important to look at is the average day supply. So those are the lines at the top. If you look at the um, the dark line, uh, okay, whatever it is, um, it's averaged around 45 days, uh, even though we know that uh, these drugs are eligibly dispensed in 90-day supply. As I said earlier, Quebec typically dispenses in 30-day supply, and 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 elsewhere, <clears throat> excuse me, elsewhere in Canada, they don't always dispense in 30 or 90-day supply for maintenance drugs. So it typically averages around 45. But if you look at the pink line in 2020, uh, in April is where you really saw it drop down to that 30-day supply, and then as the restrictions were lifted, it started to increase back up in the, the, next, the upcoming months to similar to where it was the prior year. Now looking at acute medications, uh, our transaction volume was down quite a bit. And, and you can see it really starts in April when, when, when the world really started to shut down. Um, the reasons are, are twofold. Patients were not seeing doctors in person to get diagnosed and issued a new prescription. Uh, also patients were really foregoing seeking medications for more common ailments. So if you think of someone that has a cold that may have gone to the doctor, uh, they just weren't doing that. No one wanted to go. No one was leaving the house. No one wanted to go see a physician. Um, some theories out there that given our heightened awareness around hygiene, given COVID-19, that maybe even common colds were not as prevalent. I mean, I think there's some truth to that. Uh, we did see transactions increasing near the end of 2020, potentially as, results, uh, as a result of, of virtual care visits that we saw um, uh, the wide adoption rate of virtual care apps uh, and people seeing their physicians get the prescriptions that way that they, they were really unable to before. Um, I won't spend much time on this, it's very busy, that, but the idea was to look at some potential treatments for COVID um, and see whether anything's really jumping out and to be honest, really there wasn't. Uh, although one medication did see a blip in in mid-2020, that's when that certain orange-looking leader in the country south of us 
made one of several invalidated treatment suggestions. So if you look at the light green, uh, light gray line for hydro, uh, hydroxychloroquine, it did see a bit of a jump. And again, that was around when I, I believe he was saying um, that it could be a potential treatment. And then, and of course, if we could ever um, see Lysol claims for medical use, I'm sure we might have seen a bit of a, <laughs> of a, a blip there too. All right, let's jump on to our ever popular therapeutic category analysis. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this because it's going to be presented uh, next week in more detail. So if I look at our top therapy categories year over year, there's virtually no change in rankings and percent eligible amount from the last period. Uh, so as I said, next week, uh, my partner in crime, Michelle, is going to present the medication management session and is going to go into much more detail across therapy categories. When we look at an individual drug level, there are a few notable changes, just to level set as well. When we're listing drug products, it's all the DINs, combines, the different strengths, et cetera. We actually include generic equivalents as well. Um, that's probably a good reason why you'll see Concerta, Ciprolex there as well, because they, they, I mean, they do have generic equivalents that are driving them up the, up the list. Uh, and insulin, <clears throat> we are including yeah, insulin glargine as well. Um, so that's largely driven by the drug Lantus. Again, Freestyle Libre is up, but not as drastic of a jump as we saw in last year's review. Uh, Ozempic, um, also one of the newer GLP-1 diabetes drugs, shows the largest gain. Uh, so again, we'll get into that in greater detail next week. So time again for another polling question. What disease category had the largest downward swing in number of claims from 2020 compared to 2019 when we look at adults. Diabetes one, is it number two, antibiotics, any infectives, or is it number three, depression? Okay. So if you answered antibiotics, any infectives, you're right. So as mentioned earlier, that could be explained by the absence of, of people seeking treatment for you know, more common ailments. Um, and you also see that here we we do see a, an upward trend in, in more chronic conditions at the bottom of the slide. So those have increased year over year for, for adults. And again, that'll be, uh, we'll get into more detail next week. In the so one last polling question. What disease category had the largest upward swing in number of claims, so upward swing this time, in number of claim, claims from 2020 compared to 2019? And this is for dependent children. Was it allergies, was it birth control, or was it three, depression? The answer is depression, as you see here. It uh, went up 20% uh, for in the dependent age group. Dependence is, is typically, you know, under 25, under 21. Uh, potentially, there's a linkage between COVID-19, you know, the feelings of isolation and depression in children. Uh, the session later, after mine, um, hosted by our Chief Neuroscience Officer, Dr. McIntosh, she's going to focus largely on understanding and treating depression, so more to come on that. And I'll briefly zip through these cohort analysis. So we're trying to look at a five-year period and, and see what has really changed based on, on age. Um, younger age here, we're going to see claims for antibiotics, asthma, allergies, and ADHD, so no surprise and very little change. As we continue to the 20 to 39 age group, products relative to that cohort appear, such as birth control, so we weren't going to see that much in the under 20, but you're going to start to see it in the 20 to 39. Um, also of note is depression has gone from 7th rank to 4th rank in 4-year period. Across the board, we are seeing and things like that have been removed and more people are seeking. Uh, if we look at 40 to 59, this is where we're seeing a lot of the age-related chronic conditions emerge. I'm going to fly through some of these. Um, medication possession ratio. So this is a common method of, of measuring adherence. As you'll see here, we brought this in last year for the first time. Now we're actually looking at a five-year period of trend of these really uh, these uh, drug categories that are highly uh, or high cost across our book. Uh, you can see almost all of them, with the exception of diabetes, uh, adherence seems to be worsening. 
um, diabetes may be stabilized simply because there have been some advancements in that class to actually increase compliance. Okay, we're going to end off with some plan design trends. Based on our book of business, generic substitution is in effect, um, based on the number of certificates under a plan that has it, 88% uh, of our certificates now in 2020 has some form of, of generic substitution. And if we translate that 88% of number of certificates into the actual number of groups, it's actually more groups uh, that have it. 94% of total groups have some form of generic cell. Uh, Coinsurance, so we've moved to these uh, funky donut charts this year, just to keep everyone on their toes. Um, we're seeing coinsurance uh, still a, a large uh, plan design driver. Um, more and more plans are looking to contain costs by implementing coinsurance. And obviously they wanna make sure that the, uh, the members have some skin in the game. Uh, if you look to the right, we're breaking down what those coinsurance schemes look like and by and large 80% is where we're. Annual maximums, so still very, very rare. Uh, we have seen a slight increase over the last five year period. Um, and again, some plans uh, were looking to, to save costs and this, this is a way to cap your exposure for sure. Uh, the most common being between 2,500 and 5,000, which is very quite quite low. Uh, those tend to be smaller plans, um, and it's obvious because given you know an impact of one or two people on uh, catastrophic claims, it could be a big a big hit to the plan. Uh, deductibles again not widely used. The majority of plans don't have it, um, but if we if we look at those that do. Um, Usually it's around that two dollars or five dollars. So deductibles don't aren't very effective, right? They don't, they're fixed. They don't, uh, they don't rise with inflation. Um, so they erode over time, given the average cost per claim. So we're not seeing them used very much. Uh, from a dispensing fee cap perspective, uh, we are seeing that um, still, uh, you know, about thirty-four percent of plans actually do employ a cap. And when they do, um, I mean, the distribu distribution hasn't changed much over the five-year period. Uh, when they do, it's usually, you know, around seven to eight dollars. So they are a good way to incentivize members to shop around to save out-of-pocket costs. Uh, but it gives them the choice as well to still pay out-of-pocket the difference between the cap and what was what the pharmacy is charging. So it still gives them that if, the, if convenience means that much to them. If I look at formulary type. Um, vast majority of certificates continue to be covered under open formularies. Uh, so, but what's important to note is open formularies often will have exclusions, you know, certain lifestyle classes are maximums, um, and also by and large will be subject to prior authorization as well. Uh, we are starting to see a, a slow increase in the managed uh, formularies. And then from provincial mimic formularies is kind of, they're not widely used and haven't moved much. And, and much of that's because their coverage is limited and, and um, uh, very restrictive. Okay, so uh, prior authorization, so that really means, as most of you know, that the subset of drugs in the formulary require that the patient to meet certain criteria and clinical guidelines before it's approved. Uh, so most plans do include this as a standard. Most insurers include it as a standard, uh, depending on the drugs. The drugs that are subject to prior authorization could vary quite a bit from plan to plan and insurer to sure, um, but it is a mechanism to make sure that for these new drugs, uh, the, the patient is taking them at the right time based on medical evidence. And making up a bit of ground here, so we're on to our summary. So in summary, uh, monthly eligible amount per insured saw 3.6% increase over last year, and that, uh, and that was lower than the prior year that we looked at. So the increase was based slightly more on increased utilization compared to the change in the average cost per claim, as we talked about. Specialty drug costs continue to rise at a high pace, trending at 8.7% in monthly cost per insured year over year. 
Although lower than last year's increase of 10.1%, specialty drugs now account for 32% of claimants, or 32% of drug costs, and also the claimant exposure to specialty drugs, as we saw, is increasing. Uh, we are seeing much higher biosimilar use in BC, given the public policy that was implemented. So this trend will likely continue in other provinces that have or will be following suit. So Alberta's uh, implemented and, and Ontario will, it's expected will follow. Okay, so COVID-19 had an impact on utilization of acute therapies, therapies as we showed, uh, different filling patterns of maintenance medications as well. Um, we did see some increase in depression claims that were noting given the pandemic's impact on mental health. Also, delayed treatments due to COVID-19 may have additional impact on poorer health in the future. Also, adherence could be improved across several chronic conditions, and that could have a positive impact on treatment outcomes. Uh, chronic conditions combined with high-cost treatments for more rare disease dominate the top drug class profiles, more specialty drugs, and advanced treatments options for diabetes, for example, emerge. And we do continue to see slow progression in plan design features to contain costs. Uh, however, I, we may start to see more increased adoption given the business struggles to maintain healthy balance sheets over COVID-19 that, that we know that's happened across Canada. Uh, I think we may start to see more you know, product listing agreements, biosimilar strategies, high cost claim and chronic disease management programs.